This episode of Play contains strong language. And I remember the first person I ever visited, I walked into the room and um, his boyfriend and his mother were on either side of him. He was lying in a bed, this guy. And it, it almost looked like uh, a scene of the cross because you had the mother and then you had uh, the, the dearest friend or lover on the other side. And they were feeding him orange juice from a straw you know, dipping the straw in and then dropping it into his mouth like a, like a baby bird. And uh, he was so emaciated. And I remember kind of my interior was gasping. You know, I was just so shocked. That's Father William Hart McNichols. He's a Catholic priest, an artist, a poet. Some people have even told me they think he's a mystic, a saint. He's also gay. In the 1980s, Bill lived in New York, ministering to HIV and AIDS patients. An old picture of him shows a young man in a black button-down shirt with a white collar. His hair is long, covering his ears. A piece of rope hangs around his neck. Affixed to it is a wooden cross. Back then, Bill was studying art, trying to become a children's book illustrator. But as he saw young gay men, people just like him, being struck down by a terrifying illness, he decided he had no choice but to act. And it took me a while to to um, get out of that shock. And it took me a while before I knew what, what to say and what to do. This is Plague, untold stories of AIDS in the Catholic Church. I'm Michael O'Loughlin, a journalist covering the Catholic Church in the United States. For the last few years, I've been interviewing Catholics who worked on the front lines of the AIDS epidemic. Nearly everyone I interviewed pointed out that early on during the AIDS crisis, there wasn't that much for doctors to do, but there was still a lot of need. There was social isolation. There were practical things that people needed help with, like grocery shopping and cooking. And because a diagnosis of AIDS often meant an early death, patients had questions similar to those anyone else with a terminal illness might have. Are my affairs in order? Am I reconciled with my loved ones? Am I ready to die? That's why in this episode, we're telling Bill's story, the AIDS crisis from the perspective of a pastor, trying to figure out how he can best respond to the overwhelming need he encounters. More after the break. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org. Bill's story has a lot of twists and turns. It's emblematic of the chaos he and others felt at the time. Bill, as he insisted I call him, was born into a political family in Colorado. His dad had been the governor. One of Bill's most vivid childhood memories was meeting John F. Kennedy, the first Catholic president. Later on, Bill chose to become a priest. He entered the Jesuits. But he says the political education he received as a kid, it didn't go to waste. People always ask me, did anybody in your family go into politics? And I always say, nobody but me. Church politics, it's so ancient and so old. And um, it sort of makes Washington look like kindergarten. As we'll see, the decisions Bill made as a priest were seen by some as controversial. When Bill arrived as an art student in New York, the AIDS crisis was just beginning. He remembers hearing about people getting sick, and he recalls how protest groups were targeting all kinds of institutions, including the Catholic Church and New York's Archbishop, Cardinal John O'Connor. Bill actually attended an early meeting of ACT UP, the protest group we talked about in the last two episodes. But Bill was more mild-mannered than many of the other people there. Plus, he wasn't sure how he'd be able to help people in the midst of an AIDS crisis as a Catholic priest. The whole thing was 
was treated in the very beginning like leprosy. And people were were pretty terrified. I was really scared, too. Bill remembers the first Mass he held specifically for people with AIDS. This is early in the crisis. People still weren't sure how it was spread. Some people thought it might be airborne. Others wondered if it could be spread through saliva. These fears affected how the Mass would be celebrated. Bill went ahead helping to plan the Mass, which included conversations about how to make people feel less afraid. I remember the meeting for the the Mass was about, do we let people drink out of the chalice? And um, everybody had decided no. We would use intinction. Normally at Mass, Catholics taking communion drink from a shared cup called the chalice. But because people didn't know how AIDS spread at this Mass, the host would be dipped into the chalice to avoid spreading germs. The thought was that this method, called intinction and uncommon in Roman Catholic churches in the U.S., would prevent transmission. Bill says it's just one example of how much people did not know about AIDS at the time. There was, of course, no way it could have been spread through communion. You know, if you're going to do intinction, you have to put it on their tongue. What happens if you touch their tongue? You know, this was early on, and people, people did not know. Those were some of the planning issues. After Mass, so many people approached Bill that he decided to start holding regular services called healing Masses. A healing Mass is a special service in which worshipers pray that they or their loved ones will be healed of their illness, or at least given a sense of peace. They're fairly uncommon, but Bill felt many people had few other options. After all, effective medication to treat HIV and AIDS was still several years off. At Bill's healing Mass, the church was filled with sick people. People struggling to walk, people covered with lesions. Some people, too weak even to sit up, lay down in the pews. While the priests who ran the parish were happy to let Bill use their church, there were fears that the weekly parishioners might be frightened. So Bill wasn't allowed to advertise the masses. They were afraid that if the parishioners knew that there was people with AIDS coming there, that uh, it would scare them away. And... No matter how much you tell people, people with AIDS are not, you're not going to get it by, by um, them sitting on the same bench you do. People still have those fears. Bill remembers being in awe at the number of people who showed up each week. At the end of his masses, Bill and a few lay people stood in the front of the church. He invited people who were sick to come forward and tell him their prayers. It was here that Bill learned intimately about the immense suffering afflicting people with AIDS and their loved ones. So let's say they'd come up to me and I'd say, what, what is it that you want from God? And they'd say, well, I would like my headaches to stop, or like, I would like my diarrhea to stop, or I would like to be completely healed of AIDS. And whatever they would ask for, I would pray for. Um, or I would like, I would like um, the night sweats to stop, or I would like to not be so terrified all the time. So, so it was a profoundly beautiful experience. Do you remember David Pace from our first episode? I first met David a couple of years ago, long before I learned about Father Bill McNichols. But as I was reporting this story, David told me that he and Bill actually shared a connection. In the 1980s, David was diagnosed with HIV, and his partner, also named Bill, had found out he had AIDS. When David's partner became really sick, David suspected that the end was near. He was devastated, and he felt he needed spiritual support. One night in particular still stands out vividly, even 30 years later. We had a nurse uh, 24-7 in our apartment, and I told her that I was going to go to Father McNichol's healing mass. I would be gone for an hour, and I would come back. And so what I did is I climbed in bed with Bill, and I said, "Uh, Bill, I'm going to go. Father McNichol is having his healing mass, and I'm going to ask him for a special blessing for you. And uh, 
I'll be back in about an hour. And by that time, he was pretty, he was uh, semi comatose. He was not really um, comprehending much. At the Mass, David approached Father McNichols. I went up to Bill and I said, to Father McNichol, and I said, uh, I think Bill is in his last stages, and I'd like to ask you for some kind of message. And uh, he said, when you go home tonight, tell Bill that the Blessed Virgin uh, Mary is setting up Luminaris to guide you home. So I did. I went um, back to the apartment. I got in bed with him, and I held him, and I whispered that message to him. And he died about four hours later. David imagines that the candles, the Luminara, guided his partner home after he died, that they made it easier for him to find his way. That image brought comfort to David at a time when it felt his world was falling apart. He said he used the same image countless times, trying to bring solace to dying friends and their loved ones. Bill wrestled with what he was being called to do as a priest in the midst of the epidemic. Healing masses were one part of that, but his reach at those services was limited. People couldn't sit up in bed, never mind get to church. Bill wanted to do more. He wanted to meet people where they were. So he signed on to visit patients as a chaplain at St. Vincent's, the hospital we explored in the last episode run by the Sisters of Charity. Bill visited hundreds of patients over a seven-year period. Some he ministered to in their final days, when they might not have even known that a priest was there. Others he befriended, accompanying them from health to sickness and finally to death. We'd go to movies together or go to lunch together, and I'd really get to know him. Sometimes patients asked Bill for the kinds of things any person might ask a priest. Only there was a sense of urgency, as their time was short. One of the guys that I was visiting wanted to become a Catholic. So I instructed him, and he couldn't get out of bed. You know, I mean, he was unable to leave, but he wanted to become a Catholic before he died. And it was just, it was sheerly his idea. I mean, it was his doing. You know, nobody was pushing him in any way. But I was very excited, and I was like bringing him books, and he would read them, and then we'd talk. And finally the day came for the baptism, and and Sister brought in a cake. And um, I brought in a white T-shirt for him to put on for the baptism. And uh, there was another guy who wanted to get married to his girlfriend. He was uh, uh, had gotten, you know, AIDS through IV drug using and he wanted his girlfriend to get his apartment and his money and stuff so we had a wedding with him in bed and sister went out and bought another cake you know a wedding cake this time so those things were are things that i will never forget bill had moved to new york to be an artist and he continued to paint remember the story he told at the beginning of this episode that's what he recalls of his first hospital visit Images like that, of young men laying in bed, being fed through straws by their loved ones, they burn themselves into Bill's memory. He describes that first bedside visit as a crucifixion scene. During his chaplaincy, Bill turned to his art. He wasn't sure how it would be received, but it turns out that Bill's paintings helped other people see AIDS in a new light. My name is Joan Blanchfield, my age. We ask everyone, I promise. <laughs> it's just a standard question. Then. I'm over 80. Does that do? This is Joan. She was a nurse at St. Vincent's during the height of the AIDS epidemic. Bill and Joan worked on the hospice team. 
Joan said what really stuck out to her about Bill's art was the way he incorporated the visible markers of AIDS into his work. In particular, she was moved by how he painted Jesus. She remembers a traditional painted icon with a gilded Christ hanging from a simple brown cross against a black background. He presented to our hospice one of his paintings, and it was uh, the crucified Christ with the Kaposi's lesions all over his body. It was, you know what Kaposi lesions? They're kind of purpley. They're round. Maybe they were an inch, two inches, and they would weep sometimes. If they were on their face, many times the patients would try to cover it with makeup. It didn't really work very well, but they would be all over their bodies, right down to their feet. And that's the way he portrayed Christ with these lesions all over his body. It was very moving. Because I had a patient with Kaposi's, and I could see him suffering as Christ suffered. St. Vincent's was a Catholic hospital. Much of the staff, like Joan, appreciated Bill's work there. But not every patient wanted to be visited by a chaplain. At this time, the relationship between gay activists and church leaders was fraught. It was all over the news. The last person some gay men wanted to see was a priest. Bill respected that but he did his best to be present for those who asked. When I was a hospital chaplain, I did not wear clerics on purpose because I knew that people were so hostile about the church. What I wore, I had a a suit coat, and I had a button on the suit coat of St. Anthony holding the baby. And I'd walk into a room, and of course, I was 33, and and, uh, the guys would say, oh, who are you? And I'd say, I'm a chaplain. And I'd say, oh, what kind of a chaplain? And I'd say, Catholic. And they'd say, are you a priest? And I'd say, yeah. And by that time, they weren't afraid of me. Each day he was at the hospital, Bill was handed a sheet of paper by one of the Sisters of Charity at St. Vincent's. It included the names of the patients he was to see that day. Bill still has all those sheets, keeping them in a scrapbook he calls the Holy Souls. To this day, Bill prays for them each year on All Souls Day, a day set aside for Catholics to remember the dead. Every November 2nd, I take that scrapbook and put it under the Eucharist. So I remember everybody every year, and I look at their names again. The experience of seeing gay men angry at the church, even Catholic men in their final days, it affected Bill. The AIDS crisis made many closeted gay men deal honestly with their sexuality, as they saw friends and loved ones dying from the disease. It put their own mortality front and center. Many decided that despite the consequences, estrangement from family, loss of job, threats of eviction, they had to be honest with themselves and with others. And they came out as gay. Bill was no different. At that time, if you worked with people with AIDS and you were a man, uh, you you were out, you know, because no other men did it. So um, I, I felt at that time that it was important for me to be one of of the the suffering people and not be in any way. Um, distant or above, except that I didn't have AIDS and I wasn't sick. But if I could share at all in any part of the suffering, um, that seemed really important to me because that's what the Jesuit saints always did. Bill was approached by a group of gay Catholics. They asked him to write an essay about what it was like being a gay priest. Coming out in the 1980s wasn't easy for many people. So the group offered Bill the chance to write anonymously. And I said, well, if I'm not going to be my own name, then why would I write it? You know, it's not going to have any effect. Because the whole point is, uh, are you going to come out or not? As a Jesuit, a member of a religious order, Bill wasn't just making a solo decision about coming out. It would affect his community, other Jesuits, and the church as a whole. So he talked to his superior, whose permission he would need to write and publish the essay. His superior didn't forbid him from doing it, 
but he did warn Bill that it would affect his future ministry as a Catholic priest. It meant that I probably wouldn't be hired by any high school or any college or um, any parish at that time. And since I was, since my job was uh, an AIDS hospice chaplain and an illustrator, I thought, well, that's enough apostol, uh, enough of an apostolate for me. So I didn't think. Um, I didn't think it would bother me to be apostolically unavailable, you know. So I went ahead and wrote it. And um, at that time... If Let me explain a little bit what was going on. As a young Jesuit priest, Bill could expect to be given many different missions over the course of his life. As a high school teacher or administrator, working in a parish, maybe doing campus ministry. His superior was telling him, you can come out, but it might limit the places where you can minister in the future. Bill might have been deciding right then for himself and for the Jesuits that certain paths would be closed to him. But Bill thought about it and he wrote the essay. But as his superior had warned him, there were professional and personal setbacks almost immediately. Take the time Bill was slated to speak at an HIV conference in Pennsylvania, only to have it effectively canceled at the last minute. So I, I flew in from New York on this tiny little plane I remember, and um, I got out, and as soon as I got out, there were news people there, and there was the head of the conference there, and they said, um, the conference has been canceled. And I said, why? And they said, because of you. No one in Pennsylvania had much useful information for Bill, other than telling him that the pressure to cancel Bill's talk came from New York, from Cardinal O'Connor's office. O'Connor was the highly influential Archbishop of New York. He wielded power in the political square and inside the church. A phone call from his office could get things done, could possibly even cancel events in another state. Bill was hurt and embarrassed. The group had paid for him to attend. He had information to share, and now none of that would happen. He had questions, so he decided to go to the top for answers. I had remembered that Cardinal O'Connor said he would have a day every week, like I think it was a Tuesday or a Thursday, every single week, and any priest that wanted to could go talk to him. So I called up and made an appointment. And I went over and um, I told him who I was and what I was doing, and he was very, uh, very friendly to me. I mean, not, not cold, but but warm. And I said to him, did you call up and tell him that people couldn't come hear me? And he goes, no. He said, I never even heard about that conference. I knew nothing about it. Bill says he believes the Cardinal was telling him the truth. During that meeting, O'Connor told Bill about his own hospital visits to people with AIDS and thanked Bill for his ministry, even though it was still quite controversial. Bill found that particularly moving. Remember, Bill's a young priest at the start of his career, taking risks with his work, while O'Connor was one of the most powerful people in the church. Those kind words from such an influential figure meant a lot to Bill. When I left him, I remember uh, saying something like, and he said, I'm so happy you're, you're doing what you're doing. And I said, well, if you were my age, I think you'd be doing exactly what I'm doing. And he walked me to the door, and I remember, you know, those doors are giant. They're the giant metal doors, and um, I stepped outside, and I walked down the stairs, and I turned around, and he was still standing there. And I just, I, I suddenly realized, oh my God, this man is a prisoner, you know, in this giant uh, gilded cage, and um, he's standing there and getting tinier and tinier as I walked away, you know. Not everyone was as supportive of Bill's work. Lots of people had opinions about his decision to come out as gay and his ministry to people with AIDS. Still, he's glad he came out publicly. He said his decision to be honest with himself and with other people allowed him to minister more effectively because there were fewer barriers between him and the people he served. And besides, he was able to brush off the hateful comments. 
I think if you're gay, you get used to rejection for what you are. In some ways, don't you think? Bill said that in so many ways, his work was intensely fulfilling. He witnessed deep suffering, and he didn't have a lot of answers. But he felt like he had found his calling, that he was helping people. Some of it was was so beautiful, you know, and I wish I could go into the amazing uh, depth of relationships that I had with these people. Because people knew that they were dying, they didn't hold back anything. So the intimacy was extraordinary. And to have that many days, seven years of intimate relationships with people, talks with people, that things that they would never tell anybody, and to be able to to talk to them when they'd say, what do you think purgatory is like? Or where do you think I'm going to go? Or what do you think it's like in heaven? Or, you know, just all these questions. Um, it was everything I ever wanted to be as a priest, and I got to do it all, you know, with with these people. But his work took a toll on him. It's still difficult for him to talk about the trauma. Um, I think we can talk. Can you ask something else? <laughs> I don't think I can get the words out. (laughs) You know, I swore I wasn't going to cry during this. And I thought, um, you know, you think it's been 30 years, but boy, um, you know, when the faces come up and the the experience of being with people... um, well, I got really All this stress took on physical operation. symptoms, and Bill had back spasms that sent him to the emergency room. Bill's Jesuit superiors asked him to take a break. But it was difficult for Bill to leave New York behind. He didn't want his AIDS ministry to come to an end, but in a way, it didn't. His art continued to reach people with HIV and AIDS. I spoke to one man who encountered Bill's art in a prayer group for gay men he attended. One evening, the group leader passed around photocopies of Bill's Stations of the Cross, a series of meditations that retrace Jesus' final days. The photocopies contained Bill's simple illustrations, black ink on white paper, barely shaded in, along with the reflections he wrote to accompany them. The man I spoke to was Stephen McDonnell. When he first encountered Bill's art, he was a young gay man in his 30s living in Toronto. It very much reflected my own journey because the stations were things like, you know, you're before Pilate, and you are told you have AIDS. And it goes through all the stations in that kind of a journey. You get your first Kaposi, you have a bout of pneumonia, uh, you deal with rejection, all of those kinds of things. And in that internal struggle between being gay and being Catholic and not wanting to leave the church and trying to find where I belong, it was a difficult journey. And all of a sudden it didn't matter to Jesus. And I did not need to conceal any part of myself to him anymore. Because one of the hardest things to pray about that McNichols' work gave me permission to do was to pray about the fact that I had HIV. At this point, the fact that Stephen had HIV was a secret, even to other members of his prayer group. So he tried to hide how moved he was by the stations. And I had a terrible uh, desire to break down and weep when we prayed it together to uh, just fall down. But I did everything I could to hold myself together because I didn't want to live with that label. If Even among gay men, if you had the positive label, people were still afraid of you. I, I can't express to you the fear or the stigma that went with HIV at the time. But when I went home that night, I prayed the stations myself and I wept and wept and wept and prayed them again. For the first time, Stephen felt a strong connection to Jesus. That was a great source of comfort to him, especially as he feared his own death was imminent. And there's a point in the uh, stations where Jesus is on the cross, a very poignant moment, certainly, and where it says I-N-R-I on the crosses that we're familiar with, Um, Instead, it had the words, uh, there was pervert, there was homosexual, there was faggot. All these horrible words were identifying Christ. And I certainly heard all those words in high school. In fact, those were some of the better ones. 
And here Jesus was on the cross with the labels that I have worn. And I had this uh, epiphany moment that uh, I was one of the people that Jesus really died to save and that he was intimately inviting me uh, to him to share the cross with him in a, in a very intimate way that's hard to describe. And I had this notion, well, Jesus sees me. And Jesus sees me as I am. And that's okay. And that I can share with him who I am. About a year ago, I hung a medal around my neck. It's small, about an inch tall and half as wide. It's sterling silver, made in Italy. The kind of trinket you can find in cathedral gift shops. On the front is the profile of St. Aloysius Gonzaga. Like Bill, Aloysius was a Jesuit. He had given up a life of privilege for one of prayer and poverty. In 1591, a plague broke out in Rome. Aloysius volunteered at the Jesuit hospital, even after he was told to stop because it was unsafe. Eventually, he too caught the plague at just 23 years old. He died. St. Aloysius has become the patron saint of those living with HIV and AIDS today. Stephen told me how meaningful he found it to have a saint, especially for him. I bought the medal because I wanted help in telling the stories of people who lived and worked during the AIDS epidemic. It turns out that Bill's artwork was hugely responsible for tying St. Aloysius to HIV and AIDS. Bill was among the first people to depict Aloysius caring for victims of this new plague, and the image stuck. The Jesuits would eventually petition the Vatican to make the association of Aloysius with HIV and AIDS official. Bill came out again in a very public way in 2002, when Time magazine profiled him for a feature about gay priests. He says the fallout was not a positive experience. At the time, some church leaders were trying to pin the sexual abuse scandal on gay priests. Bill came forward to defend them. Bill eventually left the Jesuits, but he remains a Catholic priest today. He lives in New Mexico, where he celebrates Mass at a large and growing parish. He still paints, and his icons can be seen in churches throughout the country. Much of Bill's ministry was possible because he took the risk to come out as gay. I was curious if Bill thought it was easier to be gay and Catholic today. You know, even today uh, in the church, gay people don't have a green card. Any moment you can be cut off from the church, and that, that has always been the way. And I think it still is, even though Pope Francis has been very kind. But I think it's, it's how a lot of people do feel. But coming out wasn't a one-time deal. You never, you never stop coming out. Like, I'm coming out today, you know, and I'm 70 years old. So, I mean, if I went to a new place, um, they, would, they would Google me. They would find out who I was, and then I'd be coming out again. You know what I mean? So it never, it never stops. Even though it's not always easy for him to come out, Bill said he wants other gay Catholics to know that they have a place in the church, too. I've been reflecting on Bill's courage. If he hadn't been honest with himself and with others, it's possible he never would have engaged in the ministry that provided solace to David and Stephen and many others like them whose stories we'll never know. This is partly why I wear the Aloysius Medal. As a gay Catholic, it makes me feel connected to the pioneers who came before me. To people like Bill. On the next episode of Plague, how a parish in San Francisco transformed in the crucible of the AIDS epidemic. And I was like, what? A gay Catholic church? I was astounded. I never heard of such a thing.
Plague, Untold Stories of AIDS and the Catholic Church. It's a production of America Media. I'm your host, Michael O'Loughlin. This series was written and produced by me and Eloise Blondio. The executive producer is Sebastian Gomes. Thanks to the team at America Media who helped make this episode happen. Kerry Weber, Father Sam Sawyer, Tucker Redding, and Isabel Seneschal. Sound design by Rebecca Seidel. Original music by Christopher McCormick. Art by Sean Tripoli and Allison Hamilton. Parts of this episode were recorded in the William J. Loeschert Studio at America Media in New York. This podcast was made possible through the generosity of Mark A. McDermott and Yuval David, whose gift honors and supports all LGBTQ plus persons and allies, past and present. Thanks to Father Bill McNichols, whose artwork inspired the Plague logo. And special thanks to my colleague at America Media, Father James Martin. For more about this episode, visit americamag.org slash plague. And let me know what you think by following me on Twitter at Mike O'Loughlin. That's M-I-K-E-O-L-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. Thanks for listening. Support for this podcast comes from the Catholic Health Association. CHA represents the nation's largest group of non-profit healthcare providers, with more than 600 hospitals and 1,600 long-term care and other health facilities in all 50 states. The Catholic Health Ministry cares for one in seven patients in the U.S. Learn more at chausa.org.